Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, so today we have uh, Dr. Eugene Levin. Uh, he's an expert on space tether dynamics, and he's written two books on the subject. And uh, he's worked in the past with uh, NASA, Air Force, and uh, other aerospace type organizations. And uh, he's giving a talk on uh, orbital debris removal and an innovative new approach to the topic. So please uh, give a warm welcome. Um, thank you for coming, and um, that's an interesting topic, and uh, you will be entertained. <laughs> uh, there is not much glory in removing orbital debris, but I see this as a, as a focal point where um, many issues come together that we have to solve. And we want to go to stars, but every, every time we head out of the front door, we step into this debris field, which reminds us uh, we are not ready to go anywhere until we sort out this mess. Uh, this is work in progress, and I will give you our latest perspective on this. Uh, and uh, again, it's open for all kinds of ideas. It's one of the views. Uh, this is my comrades in arms, uh, Jerome Pearson from Star Technology, Joe Carroll, Tether Applications, uh, John Olson. Well, uh, we have been crashing lands and oceans for quite a while, and then 50 years ago we got to the new frontier, and we looked around and saw this really big space, and we thought, really, we'll leave a couple of things behind and nothing will happen. So that's what we did, but with time we realized that that's a different, that's a different garbage pile, and uh, it's, it's tracked and cataloged, it's visible to all, it's international and mixed dynamically, and it cannot be abandoned by, by international law. And amazingly, it's close to capacity in many, in many places. Uh, in common life, we, we kind of think about garbage piles as, as being anonymous, and this is very, very different, very unusual. <clears throat> Outer Space Treaty, it's an amazing document. At the height of, of the Cold War, nations came together and, and decided that space is special. They said it should have no national territories, no weapons of mass destruction, no harmful contamination, and launching states are responsible. And the launching state is the one that either launches or pays for launch or provides territory or provides a facility. And it's getting complicated. Uh, look at sea launch. This, this platform is Norwegian. The first and the second stage is Ukrainian. The third stage is Russian. The payload is somebody else. And the launch team is mostly, mostly American. And it's launched out of the ocean. But all those players are launching states. They have a responsibility. Uh, treaty says that if your object breaks up, you still own and are responsible for all fragments, small and large. You can see the breakup of the uh, Japanese probe returning uh, uh, to Earth last year. The Liability Convention, it clarifies that there is no excuse for hitting something on the ground or, or somebody. And it's not an idle precaution because tracked objects uh, re-enter daily, large objects re-enter weekly, and some parts survive re enter and hit the ground. Uh, in March, this uh, Football on the left uh, hit the ground in Colorado, and it came from a Russian upper stage. Uh, at the same time, this large football on the right hit the ground in Uruguay, came from American upper stage. <clears throat> uh, the treaty says that uh, in space is different. You can say, sorry, not my fault. And this is what happened with Cosmos and Iridium. Cosmos was dead for, long, for a long time, before the collision and it could not maneuver. Iridium was operational, it could maneuver. However, um, a predicted uh, approach was more than half a kilometer and their standard mode of operation, they, they really don't, don't maneuver. It's a low ranked uh, conjunction, so they did not. And in this case, neither side is at fault. What is capacity? And, and certainly we saw these uh, amazing images from, from Pixar. 
uh, three years ago, like this massive field of dead satellites and then the, the, the scout uh, ship punching through. Uh, it is impressive, but this, we are at capacity not in this sense. So the, the density is, is still very low, however, velocities are really high. So we, the flux, the, the product of density and velocity is getting really high. And if you look at the image on the right, it's, it's a cross section of that debris stream. Uh, horizontal 360 degrees, it's a one revolution around the Earth, and vertical 1,000 kilometers, it's a span in altitude. And all those red dots, it's intersections with trajectories of objects. And every object crosses this plane every uh, hour and a half. Uh, and we have to fly through this. It's a pretty, pretty intensive uh, cross traffic. <clears throat> now, low Earth orbit is defined as up to 2,000 kilometers, and we have been accumulating uh, fragments and, and, and satellites and uh, rocket bodies steadily for 50 years, and about four years ago, things started happening. It's a different environment. Uh, 2007, the Chinese anti-satellite test, uh, an old weather satellite at 860 kilometers, and a missile launched from the, from the ground head-on. No explosives. You don't really need explosives here, because uh, the kinetic energy of the orbital motion uh, has substantially more energy than you can release from explosives. Uh, the result? Uh, the set, this bodies literally shredded each other into small pieces. And uh, what, I, what I call it shrapnel, about one and a half tons of shrapnel. And if you look at the distribution of fragments, about 3,000 trackable fragments, about a million over one millimeter. And what is most alarming, about 100,000 of fragments that are in the centimeter range, and they can take out the satellite. We don't see them but they are there. The fallout, most of them are still in orbit four years later. Uh, they create about 600 conjunctions every day within uh, five kilometers. And I, I took the snapshot on July 23rd, um, the top ranking conjunctions, and you can see with satellites, you can see like approaches uh, several hundred meters, very high relative velocities, relatively low probability, but it accumulates with time. <clears throat> What is shrapnel? And, and for, each, for each object that we track, we have about up to 50 uh, untracked objects in, in, in a centimeter range. And you can see on, on a, in the picture on the left that an aluminum ball about one centimeter in diameter can punch halfway through 18 centimeter aluminum plate. And none of the satellites have, have armor that thick. And on the right, you can see the about an inch size uh, uh, ripped area on the shuttle. It was four years ago. <clears throat> 2009, uh, Cosmos Iridium collision. Again, uh, that was not head on. That was at 100 degrees at 11.6 kilometers per second. Uh, Cosmos, again, was not operational. Iridium could maneuver, but conjunction was not rank high, so it was not different from other conjunctions that satellite was uh, having every day. And also, you, you have to think about Iridium has a lot of satellites. They, they are getting thousands of conjunctions, so they can't really maneuver uh, when uh, predicted range is, is half a kilometer. They just don't do it. It's standard practice. The outcome, exactly the same like, like the Chinese ASAT test. Uh, the, the objects shredded each other, uh, one and a half tons of shrapnel, about 2,000 trackable fragments, uh, about a million uh, over one millimeter, and again, about 100,000 of those centimeter range uh, fragments that can take out a, a satellite. <clears throat> the fallout, most of fragments are still in orbit. For each tracked one, 50 that we don't see, but they can take out a satellite. And what happens with time, those orbits spread, and they kind of uh, form a shell <clears throat> around the Earth. NASA reported last year that they were mostly dodging the, uh, their 
Earth observing satellites were mostly dodging fragments from Cosmos Iridium collision. You can see in this table those orange, orange lines that, that uh, those are four, four cases when they have to, to avoid close approaches with, with uh, fragments of Cosmos or, or Iridium. And this is four out of seven. And, and that costs fuel. <clears throat> And this one was chasing ISS, so it's a relatively small fragment, about 10, 15 centimeters, and it was looping through the ISS altitude every one and a half hours for two years, and then finally it got too close. And, and in April this year, they had to maneuver, uh, spent 70 kilograms of fuel. <clears throat> so we can, we can congratulate ourselves. We, we actually deployed a slow-release random target ASET system uh, without even trying. And um, <clears throat> if we uh, dim the stars and brighten all these objects, that's the sky we will see. And you can see uh, there is some con uh, congestion in the middle that's, that's around the poles because many of those uh, bodies are in, in polar orbits. Uh, I call it a weapon of mass conjunctions, uh, and uh, you can say that like we, we have all this warheads o overhead, and we really need to, to defuse or disarm this, this weapon. So catastrophic collisions between large objects will, will make more and more shrapnel. And even small objects uh, can smash satellites and rocket bodies into pieces. You, you can see this uh, Delta II second stage, Compared to three U cube set, if they collide, delta two will, will will be shredded into pieces. It's not really obvious, but the, but that's how much energy there is in, in this uh, collision. And now, if you look at the probability of uh, catastrophic collisions, it grows with the second power of the number of objects, and the number of objects was growing with time, uh, like approximately linearly. And what we have, we're heading toward 10% per year of a catastrophic collision. So like in the next 10 years, we'll have another one. <clears throat> uh, we measure, like we suggested some time ago, to measure the risk in, in statistical yield of fragments. You multiply the mass of an object by the probability of a catastrophic collision, and then you take a sum for whatever group of objects you want to look at. Uh, what we found that the highest risk of debris generation is around 82 degrees. So there is like a large cluster, and but, but the highest number of satellites is around 98 degrees, which is a sensing cluster. And you can look at this chart and say, well, it's good because they are at different inclinations, but that's not really the case. When we look at collision risk, we, we will see this. Uh, uh, very distinct spikes. One is at 82 degrees, the other one is at 98. But the interesting part that the spike at uh, 82 degrees is produced by the bodies in 98, and, and the spike at 98 is produced by the bodies in, in 82, so they are uh, threats to each other. Why does this happen? Um, <clears throat> when we look at the orbits, and let's say take two, <clears throat> Uh, sample orbits, 82 and 98 degrees, they actually rotate slowly, they process uh, around the axis of the Earth in opposite directions, and periodically they, they align in such a way that this is head-on traffic, and you can see on the right how it looks like. You have a bunch of uh, uh, old rocket stages flying head-on with satellites, and this is happening as we speak right now. <clears throat> so, how much do we have to remove to, to like reduce that risk? Again, we measure the risk as a statistical yield of fragments, and we, let's say we, we, well, we say that right now it's 100 percent, and uh, based on our calculations, we have to remove 2,000 tons. We, like by removing one or two or three, we, we make no difference whatsoever. We, we need wholesale removal. <clears throat> How do we remove this? 2,200 dead satellites, span stages uh, all over Leo. 2,000 tons. And th this is a very popular picture from last year. It's an artist concept. Uh, you can see it's a NASA waste management. Uh, so it's supposed to, to come close, yeah, open the bay, there is a like, robotic arm, grabs the satellite, pulls it in, closes the bay. It's a statement, it's a visual statement, but 
technically it's not doable. This job is not for rockets because when we look at the rocket equation, there is an exponential uh, term with, with a delta V. Delta V is how much you have to <clears throat> change the velocity of objects to re-enter. That delta V is huge. Like we'll be looking at like masses that are really not, not practical. Uh, and this is an estimate. We looked at a wholesale removal campaign of all span stages and dead satellites for, for different rockets. And uh, you can see those um, uh, orange dots, uh, bipropellant and uh, uh, two ion engines like whole thrusters. And Wasimir, Wasimir is uh, in development. Uh, nobody knows when it will uh, be operational. It could be really expensive and really heavy, so I, like, I kind of grade it out. And horizontal axis is the exhaust velocity of the engine. So basically, where, where Wasimir is, this is where we push the, the very edge of what the rockets can do. And on, on the left, you can see how, how many tons you have to launch. You have to launch massive amounts of rockets, and, and we're being conservative here. You probably will have to launch more than we estimate. At the same time, like from, from our standpoint, we want to be where this green dot is. We want to be on the very right. We want to launch like about one ton. But you can see that you cannot do it with rockets. We just have to stop burning fuel to make this happen, and, and there is a way to do so. Electrodynamic propulsion. <clears throat> What you do is you collect electrons on one side, you drive them through the conductor, and you emit them on the other side. Uh, you use a hollow cathode for emitter. It's a really small device, about this big. You use it just a little bit of xenon. Uh, flown many times. Uh, and you use uh, just plain aluminum tape on the other side. It's really, really simple. Uh, the current uh, interacts with the geomagnetic field and produces ampere force that you can <clears throat> use to change your orbit. Now, the, the question about closing the circuit uh, is, is, is practically resolved because it has been demonstrated twice. Uh, plasma motor generator, it's 1993, and uh, tether satellite system reflight, 1996. <clears throat> How to think about it? Think about like sailing. You can change the, the direction of the wind, but you can operate your sail. It's, it's really not widely known, but the uh, electrodynamic system was built uh, by, by Joe Carroll, and I was a part of this effort in 2000 uh, to keep Mir in orbit. The problem was that uh, uh, Russians did not have enough launch capacity at that time to supply enough fuel to keep it in orbit, so that the orbit was, uh, was going down, and it was to the point where of no return. So this system was built, it included six kilometer insulated wire and one kilometer electron collector and some pilot tether. And at the end of 2000, it was sitting, uh, it was going through expert clearance, uh, and at that time, the decision was made to uh, re-enter Mir. So here we go, we, we had uh, the, the largest man-made object re-enters, 136 tons of debris, and all this breakup and splashes in the Pacific. Uh, the system that was built for Mir is what we call hanging system, and because the tether is always uh, oriented toward the Earth, like along the local vertical. And if you see, it doesn't work very well at high inclinations where most debris is. And what we came up with the idea to, to, to rotate the system, and that, that gives a much better stability, much better angles with the field. It's a relatively slow rotation, about 15 minutes uh, per turn. But as you can see with that spinning system, it's the best performance exactly where all debris, debris are. And we can deorbit uh, about one ton object at 90 kilometers per day. That's, that's pretty good. And we don't burn any fuel. So meet our electrodynamic garbage truck. Uh, we call it electrodynamic debris eliminator, or EDI. Uh, it's only 100 kilos, uh, two of them fit into S per secondary payload slot. Uh, this picture on the right, uh, it, you can see the, the primary payload on the very right, and then this ring that holds a bunch of oddly shaped um, uh, containers, that, that's his, uh, secondary, the secondary payloads. And you can look at this box um, that, that sticks on the top. 
you can fit two of those in this box. You, you roll the tape into these rolls and they, they pack nicely in there. Um, essentially, you can think about this system as a bunch of nanosatellites nano taped together. And, and that, that's an aluminum reinforced tape, uh, like you see in this picture. That's the actual tape for this. Uh, and this one can move tons without burning any fuel again. <clears throat> Technology where we stand, uh, we don't require miracles. All components are fairly highly developed, uh, many have flown, and uh, the Naval Research Laboratory took, took the initiative. They will be flying the electrodynamic propulsion cubes at the experiment next year to show this type of propulsion. Capture, it's a sticky point, like uh, people are really afraid about approaching this whole debris, but in this case, um, we, we propose to use uh, like really large but really lightweight nets uh, and on each end we can carry about 100 nets, uh, 50 grams each, we pass it about 2-3. We actually match the velocity of the end with the orbital velocity of the debris, we pass it about 2 meters per second, uh, capture it in the net and, and drag it down below ISS where it decays by itself. <clears throat> Well, that's a presentation of uh, how a wholesale debris removal campaign could develop, and you can see accumulation of debris and, and like to, to, to 2010, that, that simulation was done then. Then we sent 12 of those garbage trucks up, and they spread out, they go into their inclinations, and they start uh, picking that uh, objects and dragging them down. So they, they, they move up pretty fast. They, they, then they grab something heavy, and they, you see like those yellow dots, they would move uh, slowly. Now, this simulation would show only just less than a month for, for each year. And um, we'll just get to the point real, really quickly. Uh, we, we certainly start from, from the objects that are uh, lowest, and then like work our way up. and. Um, uh, this, this vehicles, they don't have a problem to change orbital planes. They don't really need fuel for this. They just need some time. As opposed to rockets, like if you do it with rockets, you have a huge problem to change your orbital plane. Now, these guys are really, they can, they can go anywhere. And you can see it, uh, it takes less than seven years to clear those 2,200 satellites and 2,000 tons of... Um, of garbage, so that, that's the end of the story. And it took only 12 of those uh, vehicles each 100 kilos. <clears throat> we looked at uh, uh, orbital debris removal as a service, as a commercial service, because government doesn't really want to be involved. It's, 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 it's like city hiring some, some company to, to remove uh, waste. And, you, on the left, like vertical axis, that would be the cost per kilogram of debris removed, and the horizontal axis is uh, uh, tons of debris removed. And this, uh, uh, this blue band is a typical cost of, of launch. And our point was, if, if you are going to remove uh, debris in, in some cost-efficient manner, it should cost much less than it costs to launch. And when we looked at rockets, we, we find that, uh, and some, some, some really uh, like generous uh, assumptions was put into this. We find that with rockets, we will be paying as much for removal as we pay for launch. And, and if you have some money for, for space activity, you will rather launch than remove. So we think it's, it's a really not an attractive solution. We have to be in this green area down below to, to be uh, to be economically viable, and electrodynamic removal can do this. <clears throat> now, that's an interesting perspective. We can look at debris as a resource, not as a, not as a just a nuisance. And, for example, if you look at upper stages, it's really simple shapes. Uh, they're less sensitive. It's just a couple of uh, uh, tanks and, and uh, some old motor, highly clustered and high content of aluminum. If you look at this uh, cluster at 82 degrees, it's 450 tons of mostly aluminum. 
uh, what can we do with that material? Uh, for example, if there's about 1,000 tons of, uh, again, mostly aluminum and those old upper stages, and that is enough to build a pressure structure which will be about the size of the National Air and Space Museum in, in Washington, D.C. It's not like we would not, not like, it's not maybe not, not the best use, but, but it just gives you the scale how much material do we have in orbit. And, and on the right, you can see Hubble inside the museum. So basically, Hubble is a really big, uh, is a really big object. So it could be assembled inside such a facility or service, and you can actually put the entire shuttle inside. So this is how much material we have. And then we can actually see um, uh, the scheme of space manufacturing with that. We're kind of thinking about uh, bringing uh, materials from, from, from the moon, from the asteroids, when over has, we have a field where we can mine aluminum, and uh, that's a lot of material. And the, the only problem is we have to, to make the delivery of this material relatively cheap, which we do with electrodynamic de delivery. So the, this scheme does not work with rockets because it becomes more um, cost effective to launch them from, from the ground, but once you use electrodynamic vehicle, you can capture it, bring it to the, uh, to the processing point, you can melt it, send to 3D printers, produce some parts, and uh, deliver it to a customer. So essentially, you, you can jumpstart the space manufacturing out of that garbage pile, if you will. And, and the added benefit, you don't have to re-enter a lot of large objects, because as we saw, you have a responsibility if you hit something on the ground. Now, the idea of debris removal, um, it really entered the public consciousness and, and uh, it gets popular. We, we can see it in movies on the internet, and ne next year we'll have this IMAX movie, Space Junk 3D. Who can do it? Um, there is an interspace, um, interagency space debris coordination committee. It uh, includes 12 largest uh, space agencies. It reports to UN. Uh, they are willing players, they adopted debris mitigation guidelines, they are not binding internationally, but like every agency actually made unilateral steps to, to, to do something about this. Uh, and, and by the way, best, uh, best implementation is, is, is in the U.S. And there is a growing understanding that mitigation is not enough. Uh, mitigation means... Um, uh, for example, you, um, you, uh, you, you, you get rid of residual propellant in the upper stage so it doesn't explode, so you don't remove it, but you, you kind of reduce the risk of explosion, for example. Uh, so uh, there is understanding that mitigation is not enough because a single event like a catastrophic collision can negate the years of mitigation and we need active debris removal. What would it take? Uh, and that's the very latest. I was surprised to see this number. <clears throat> if, uh, if the members of this, uh, of this committee decide to share the expense, it only takes seven million uh, per year per agency to remove all, all rocket bodies within eight years and then go to removing old, space, old spacecraft, which will take uh, the full campaign 12 years and then Expense even go down because you only need to remove whatever is newly launched. And of course, that, that has to be open to competitive bidding and to create this market because, like, we don't pretend to be the best technology, we'll bid against it, but some, some other people will bid maybe with a better system. It's, it's just, you know, this is to, to, to set like a, um, like a reference point, if you will, to say that it's not that expensive after all. New rules, uh, yeah, I have the sign, no parking out to business hours. The problem is when you launch, uh, the, the space treaty says space is free for everybody, so you, you can't say don't launch here because somebody left a lot of garbage uh, and you can collide. So people should be able to launch, but after the useful life, they have to remove their stuff. They cannot really uh, park in orbits that can be used by other people's. And our view is that <clears throat> if uh, space agencies decide to, to bear that cost, they should really buy something for that cost. And what they buy for this is they buy a regime where 
where uh, uh, states, uh, participating states, decide or agree to remove satellites after their useful life. And uh, that kind of rule is implemented only in the U.S., but the, the, the span, it's called a 25-year rule. You have 25 years to remove your satellite, which is too long. But conceptually, it's a really, it's a really powerful statement saying that you shouldn't really leave your stuff, stuff in orbit after, after you, you're done with it. So, like we see, this kind of rule implemented uh, with a much shorter limit. Let's say you have one, one or two years to remove. If you cannot do it yourself, you, you, you just hire a, a, a commercial service. So, and and to, for this to make sense, commercial service has to be much cheaper than launch. So if you launch satellite for, let's say, $5,000 per kilogram, you should be able to remove it for, like, I don't know, three, four, five hundred dollars per kilogram. <clears throat> and and that's, that's the last one. Uh, the point that I want to make, uh, whole sale debris removal is, is a solvable technical problem, not much of financial burden, solvable legal problem, an idea that is getting popular, and it's now the matter of deciding to act. Thank you. I was uh, actually surprised by this 25-year rule. Does it mean that as soon as um, U.S. launches something, funds are set uh, aside to um, remove it in 25-year time, or uh, funding is assumed to come up from some other source in 25-year time? How does it work? No, no you have to um, like consider uh, there is no technical capability today to, to really remove something. So mm -hmm. what happens is when a launching, when a satellite operator goes to get its launch license, he mm -hmm. must present a plan mm -hmm. how the satellite will either come down on its own, because if you, if you launch fairly low, 25 years is enough for the satellite to just come down on because of the drag, mm -hmm. or uh, present a, a plan where he would say, I have enough fuel left at the end of life which, which, which uh, I can use to lower my orbit, to the point where I will have enough time to re-enter. Mm -hmm. But what happens is you don't really know if your satellite will survive until that time. Mm -hmm. So it can really die before you can, you can still have fuel, but your mm -hmm. satellite will, will not respond. So like one of those bullets will punch a hole in, somewhere in, yeah. in your computer, then you, then you can't uh, perform this maneuver. So, but that rule was introduced uh, with understanding that there is no technical cap capability to remove it when the satellite dies or it's high, but it was a statement in the, in the right direction saying you have to do this, you have to do your best to remove this. But now what we're, what we're saying, when, when we have a debris removal service, then you can say it's, you have to. If you cannot do it yourself, then hire somebody. So basically that rule uh, opens this this kind of thinking, you know, mm. it's not it's not like 100% proof. It's probably like only 50. I think that compliance rate is is really not very high because of technical reasons. But it opens this line of thinking where we we we, we just U.S. was the first to say that it should not be that way that you just leave it your stuff there. Thank you. I can imagine oxygen ions being attracted to your electron collector. Aluminium oxide isn't a very good conductor. Yeah, there is a problem of, uh, of oxidation. Uh, and um, th that, um, th that is a part that is still in, in, in process of being researched. But I think that there is a, some understanding that uh, you can have the surfaces survive long enough because those vehicles are not really designed to, to operate more than maybe five years. And, and uh, the, the reason why you have such a long uh, conductors, they are used as conductors and collectors because we really have a lot of surface. So, so we, uh, we, we probably will survive within those five year period, that five-year period with some degradation of, of collection. Uh, but that, 
That is a part of this technology development where we have to see how far we can go and with that given area. So this technique seems to be uh, best at removing large objects yes. from space. What about the centimeter uh, objects which are not able to be tracked? Are yeah. those the largest danger? Uh, they are, however, uh, we don't even see them now. So uh, right now, I'm not aware of any particular technology that can be used effectively. Uh, there is a talk about using lasers, um, but w with lasers, uh, you have, um, first you have to create a system that will actually track those. And, and then you have to be selective, like you have a, you already have about half a million of those in orbit. So, like, in, in my mind, I don't really know of a good way of doing this, and I would leave this to people who know better, but on, on our side, what we are saying, let's not make this problem worse, and let people who work with small debris figure out how to remove them. And meanwhile, we just will remove the source of uh, future small fragments. But, but, but that, that's an open question. So that, that's, that's what, why I said that this is very open to all kinds of new ideas. Like we are really renewing uh, in, in all ways, in, 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 like in technology, in, in tracking, in, in, uh, in legal sense, because we, we have to create some agreements that did not exist before, and uh, we have to do it cost effectively. So it's like, as I said, it's a, it's a focal point for me. It's a focal point of many issues. And this is one of, of issues, and uh, like as we go forward, we'll find some solution. And, uh, what is the plan to remove the uh, devices that are used for removal? Uh, remove the devices, devices uh, that are used for removal of space debris, how they will be removed or oh, uh, because, disposed of? Yes, they, they, they will deorbit themselves because mm -hmm. like, they are very agile. Mm -hmm. When they are not carrying the debris, uh, they, can deor they can move like almost like 1,000 kilometers per day down, so you can re-enter within a day. So when you decide, and um, those, um, like our electrodynamic trucks, they're designed as a multi-module, um, multi-segment um, uh, design. It, it will survive uh, cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's cut in two pieces, they're still controllable, and they can re be re-entered in, in just a few days. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole idea. Once you, once you see that your vehicle is not performing well, you just re-enter it because it's so light. It's, it's relatively cheap. It's light. You replace it. And w when you saw this... Um, Financial projections, what we uh, put into those projections is we will use them for five years and then retire and replace with, with new ones. Thank you. Well, I guess I answered all questions. <laughs> In this case, again, thank you for, uh, for listening, and uh, I invite you to think about this. It's, it's, a, it's, a, really, it's a really fascinating area and uh, should give rise to interesting ideas. Thank you.